Mike Michalowicz, I am so honored to have you on the Wedding Pro CEO podcast today. I have read many of your books, and several of them have been incredibly impactful to me. And I just cannot wait to talk a little bit more about the new Clockwork book. And so thank you so much for being here. Oh, Brandy, it's a joy to be with you. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Okay, so Mike, for anybody that doesn't know, can you give us the super high level, who is Mike Michalowicz to our listeners? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm uh, a entrepreneur my entire adult life ever since college, and I've had some tremendous ups in the <laughs> traditional sense, you know, building businesses, selling them and all that stuff. Um, but I've also had the deep valleys. I I became early, uh, in my early 30s, became a self made multimillionaire, um, building and selling businesses. And then ego and arrogance kicked in. I was, I was a dick. <laughs> I thought <laughs> I knew everything. I, I thought I was so much better than the rest of the world. And, yeah. and then I think there was divine intervention that I had to relearn what entrepreneurship is and who I was. And I lost everything. Uh, I, went, I experienced depression and so forth. But what happened was in this kind of peaks and valleys of the entrepreneurial journey, I learned that I really don't know much, maybe not anything about entrepreneurship. And I devoted myself to learn everything. So clockwork, profit first, all the books I write are really something I'm looking to master for myself and understand. Yeah. And once I find something and it works, I, I try them out in my own businesses. Once it works, then I'm like, I got to share this with other folks that may be experiencing a similar journey to mine. That's who I am. I'm an author guy now. I, uh, right. For 15 years, I've been <laughs> writing books. I love that. And so what I found really, really interesting about, I do the audio version of all of your books because I love that you read them and I love that you interject some of your personality into the audio book. But I really found it interesting that you shared so much of your peaks and valleys because I think it really helps. It helped me to relate and, and to not feel like, okay, wait, so he had this perfect road the entire time, yet I'm feeling like I'm never going to get out of this valley. So I think that really helped to relate a lot. And I appreciate that you shared so much of that in your books. Yeah, very, thank very you. helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important. I, I think some books I've read in the past, um, the author, I think they have good intent, but it's, yeah. it often comes across to me as pontificating or as someone on a pedestal that's unreachable. Yes. Um, that's not always the case, but I struggle to absorb those books. I think the content can be amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know if I can really do this because they're so much further ahead than me. So I thought, and I feel it's very important for me to reveal, I'm not further advanced than anyone else. I'm not better than anyone else. I just have these experiences that are starting to serve me or have served me and I want to reveal it. And I think if we realize that we are all in this entrepreneurial journey together, we're just at different stages. Mm -hmm. We can all be supportive of each other. To me, that's just a much more empowering approach. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think it it really does make it so much more relatable as a business owner mm. to say, you know, okay, wait, he went through this too. And actually, I mean, you describe a very low place in your career journey that I think makes it really interesting to say, wow, if he can be here from there, then, you know, I can definitely do this too. And so really following this methodology, um, Profit First is probably my favorite book I've ever read. Oh, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> but I, and I, I share it with so many people, but today I really wanted to talk about clockwork. And the reason for that is a couple, a couple of reasons. One, you just expanded and revised it. So I'm thrilled to get that into the hands of our listeners, but also because when I really think about what is the resource for me in my journey that really helped me to think differently about my business, not just mm. really you know, here's something that you can do differently. It really helped me to completely rethink the way I ran my business. The clockwork is it. And so I always encourage entrepreneurs to kind of start here, especially in our industry, because we're service-based. And yeah. I was kind of telling you before the show, I, your book struck me so much because it's not just like make more widgets and you can become a millionaire. It really right, helps right. you to understand that even in a service-based business, you can rethink your business to scale without you completely burning out. Very much so. You know, one of the stories I put in the book was I, I looked at the most creative, potentially the most creative industry in the world where the owner has to do the work. And to me, that was painters. Right. Like mm. if you do painting high-end portraits, clearly it has to be you and therefore you're constrained to just you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I put in there, and it's in the original book too, a story, story of a guy named Peter Lely. He is a painter from the 1800s 
who painted thousands of paintings where his contemporaries were doing only a few hundred in the same lifespan. And so how is that possible? Did, did he work like a maniac? No, he invented paint by numbers. <laughs> what he would do is he'd be commissioned to do a painting. He would do the facial part, but a painting back then in particular were from floor to ceiling. These were massive portraits and castles and so forth. He would then go back to his shop and he'd have his apprentices follow a paint by numbers. He'd say, hey, I painted uh, that body type number three. Let's use that background seven, clothing four. And then the apprentices would do the 95% of the work. He still did the high end, very specific part, what you were most judged on, mm -hmm. but the rest was outsourced. And I think in any industry, weddings too, there is maybe something as a wedding planner, as someone that runs this business, maybe there's something that's that special secret sauce that only you can do. And I'd even argue at a certain point that even that can be assigned out. But let's try to reduce you just to that. Have everyone else do the other 95% and that will be a massive transformation for your business. Yeah, I think that that's so important, especially in a service-based business. And you go through mm. this in the book is really to like analyze what is that queen bee role? What is that thing that has to be protected, that has to be served, that if that doesn't run, nothing else runs in your business? And would you say that in a lot of service-based businesses, that would be sales or can it vary by business? It varies by business. And I would say it's it's actually not often sales. And that's why I, when I did the revised and expand edition of the book, I'm just pointing because it's off to the side here. I have it sitting here. Like I even got <laughs> okay. a camera that cuts too. to it so I can do this. Look at that. <laughs> I got a, a, a model camera for it. I love it. But <laughs> what um, I found is there's a more efficient way to find the QBR. Okay. And what it is, is first identify what do you want to be known for? I call it the big promise. So as a wedding planner, do you want to be known for perhaps the most elaborate weddings? Do you want to be known for the most efficient? Uh, you, you bring in all the resources. Do you want to be the most decorative? I think yeah. you can pick it. It doesn't all have to be the same. Once you identify what you want to be known for, it's the number one activity, the QBR is, that supports that, that manifests that. So if you're known for um, making weddings that just have such wonderful decoration, it's so con con uh, cohesive, it yeah. works together, that would be considered the QBR. Uh, the activity that does that. So maybe it's the procurement of all of the materials, flowers, pictures, and so forth, lighting effects, the procurement of that, or or the the understanding of how the technology and those elements work together. Mm -hmm. That's QBR. And I'd argue if you then focus on that, you excel at that, your reputation will precede you. In, in sales, to your point, sales then becomes a no-brainer. People start saying, you are the world's best. Um, kind of like a surgeon. If you're a leading heart surgeon uh, or, or you need, say, I'm a customer, I need one, I will go out of my way to find her and say, I want you to be my heart surgeon. And, and I'll say, how many times have you done this before? Hundreds, thousands? Fantastic. I will seek them out because of their reputation for excellence. They don't have to sell me because they're so good at what they do. So the QBR is an elevation of your reputation to the highest level. Most businesses don't know what their promise is or they make many promises. We're cheap, we're fast, we're amazing, everything's perfect. And we're trying to do all of it, which then dilutes our ability to do anything one one thing extraordinarily well. It's really interesting that you described it that way. And I will say I'm reading through the revised and expanded version now. So I, I'm actually really excited to um, dig into that a little bit more because one of the things that I teach my students all the time is I, we talk about Instagram a lot, you know, how to how to be unique, how to say how to get somebody to click on your profile. Like you really have to identify what makes you stand out among your competition? And so it sounds like even more that would play into this as well, because it's like, if you don't know what you stand for, if you don't know why you're different, then you're a commodity. That's exactly right. And, and most businesses compete as commodities. Now, here's the interesting thing. Most consumers are seeking commodities. I can go back to that uh, analogy with doctors. Uh, the general practitioner, for example, attracts a lot of customers. Uh, and, and we can go for them for a lot of reasons. I got something with my skin or I got a cough that won't go away. I'm running a fever. Go to a general practitioner. But we, when we use a general practitioner, we look for convenience. Are they local? Are they cheap? You know, if the copay is more than 25 bucks, that's outrageous. And if my doctor, my general practitioner, if he went across the country and said, uh, hey, keep coming here, uh, I'd be like, no way. It's, it's not convenient. Yeah. Or if he says, my copay is not 25 bucks. I'm not making money. It's got to be 50,000 bucks. I'm like, are you insane? But now think about 
the heart surgeon, when I have a life threatening situation or a life altering situation, and I need someone that's a specialist, I will fly around the globe to find them and I'll pay a premium. That is the, uh, the smaller sector of the community, but they are the most engaged. When it comes to weddings, there are a lot of people, and we all know this, they're just looking for the cheap, easy solution. Yeah. I want my back neighborhood. I'm going to sh price shop you around. And there are certain people who say, my wedding is life altering. This is so defining of me. This has to be done right. And therefore, I will seek out the best at, and they'll define X. It's the most decorative, or it's the most uh, entertaining, or it's the most unique or different. They're going to define that thing they need to find, and they will seek you out. So you got to be clear at what, you're, what you are best at. Yes. The heart surgeon, not the general practitioner. Right. Oh my gosh. This is so helpful. And I know that our listeners are listening, kind of thinking, okay, this is why, this is why it's so important to define what that is. It's not only just what you're putting out there, but it's also really so that your employees can start to understand that they protect that at all costs. I love that you call that that queen bee because it's, you know, that you're now everyone's working to protect that and to uphold that as Correct. they go about their their job, right? And one of the things you did in this expanded version that I noticed right away was that you have a note to employees in there. Yes. What made you do that? Because I, I literally was like, okay, I'm now sending this book to all of my staff. <laughs> yeah, an email that opened my eyes. And um, I, I, I didn't even see this. I, I was such a mistake. When I wrote the book um, and started circulating, I get emails back from readers. And one reader in particular said, I'm implementing clockwork. I love it but I can't share it with my employees because they think that I'm working or I'm making a living off of their sweat, that I'm going to live a life of glamour uh, while they are in the sweatshop. Yep. Therefore, I can't share this with them. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the totally opposite message I want to send. By clockworking our business, by making it running more efficiently, you're not making people work in a sweatshop. You're empowering them to elevate to the highest levels of experience. Mm -hmm. Actually, most business owners restrict that. They're the, they're the chief, they do everything, and everyone else is the minion. Yes. But by extracting ourselves from the business, they're not minions, they are the chiefs. It's the ultimate form of empowerment. I have a saying in the book, I say the number one job of an entrepreneur is to be a creator of jobs, not the doer of jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I wrote this, this, rewrote the book, is to really get that message across and to empower employees to experience and express themselves at the highest levels that they want to. Yeah, I it's funny because I read Clockwork, you know, several years ago and I never considered sharing it with my employees really for the same reason, not because I felt like they were working in a sweatshop because I do feel like we implemented well all of the things in Clockwork and our team does feel empowered, but I still kind of had that same feeling where it was like, well, I don't want them to think I'm just drinking my ties and, you know, in Hawaii, that's not what I'm doing, but I love the way that you gave that note to employees and how you described it, that now it can almost be like this book club of sorts for your team to really understand what it is you're doing as the CEO, right. you know, right? And, and as that person who's kind of building up this growth and how they can play a role in it. So I think that that was, for me, I'm really excited to get it into the hands of my staff this fall. So I think that was a really smart move, a really, really smart move. I love it. So Mike, can you tell us, for anybody that's read Clockwork and yep. now they're thinking, okay, what would make me, what do I need to get out of the revised and expanded version? What are some of the things um, that we can find in the new version? Yeah. So it definitely starts off with employee empowerment. Mm -hmm. That is the first big step to really get employees engaged. So each section speaks to them specifically and what they can do to elevate the company, but really elevate themselves. That's the key. We're all looking to be the best version of ourselves mm -hmm. and great leaders will empower that. So you'll be taught that. The other thing is um, I added uh, an element called treasure. I used to have this concept called the three T's to uh, trash trim or transfer work that we have to bring about efficiency. But there's certain elements you need to treasure. The things that you love to do, once a business can run in your absence, you are permitted as a business owner to come back and do what you want to do. Yeah. Some people read the book and said, I, I don't want to do clockwork because I I want something to do in my life. And that wasn't the intention either. It was where there wasn't a dependency on you or any single individual, because if that person isn't available for whatever reason, the business collapses. So first the business needs to run in our absence. And then once we prove that we can treasure certain work for me, I love two things. I love writing books. I love being the spokesperson, kind of what we're doing now. Yes, Those are two things. My, I've been taking these four vacations, one of these 
methods of implementing clockwork for now five years. And as a result, the business can run without me. Um, I'm convinced of it because we test it out every year. And uh, now I've reinserted myself in a way that's joyful for me. So that's my contribution to the business. I talk about the uh, five Ds. There used to be the four Ds. These are about transferring from, or the elements of doing, deciding, uh, delegating, and ultimately designing the stages a business has to have addressed. But there's a new one called downtime. There was research conducted in England, especially in the knowledge worker space. People like they're doing what we're doing where you have to kind of conceptualize and stuff. They identified that regardless of the hours worked, the average knowledge worker is producing 3.2 hours per day. Okay. And to give that context, that means you can work an eight hour day or a 12 hour day or a four hour day. And on average, it's still 3.2 hours of production because the human mind, the human body is like a battery. It drains. We need to recuperate. So there's ways to leverage this. One thing is there is a community of part-time employees or people seeking part-time employment who is absolutely something you should tap into. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, about 60% of our own staff, we have 22 employees here now, 60% uh, of our staff are part-timers and they produce at the exact same level as the full-timer. Mm -hmm. So of course the question is, well, why have any full-timers if it doesn't matter? Some people for their life objectives need a full-time position, mm -hmm. but to expect that they're going to be producing eight hours straight is impossible. So we have a structure here to give people that relief recharge, basically move forward in sprints, bang out a lot of stuff in a short period, rest, recover, socialize is actually important, then sprint forward again. And our business is very productive. I would say as a result of implementing clockwork here, and we have over a thousand documented implementations now, these businesses consistently are producing at a higher level than their contemporaries with less employees. And I'd argue it's because we are moving forward in these sprint elements as opposed mm -hmm. to just trying to slog through continuously. Yeah. And it goes so well with kind of where our world is right now, right? Uh, people want to feel empowered one more than ever. They want to, we have a, an incredible amount of fractional workers, fractional labor, right? Where people want to have their own business and work, you know, five hours a week for this person or 20 hours a week for this person. And so it, it really makes sense to run your business in this way, especially now with what's going on in our world. And I know that we're, I, I want to wrap up Mike and I, I, but I really want to touch on this treasured that you just talked about because yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. for my listeners and for my students, I hear this all the time when I start to really try to push them towards this, you know, building a business, not building a job. You want to build something that you can walk away from or that you can be free from. A lot of the pushback I get is, but I love I love doing weddings. Like I want to do it. I, I don't want to walk away. And so you talk about this in the book is you also share that same passion of you're not drinking Mai Tais on the beach for eight hours every day, but you don't, you're not required to be part of the day to day anymore. That's right. So there, um, I, I was doing a survey of a group. I was recently speaking about clockwork, revising, expanded, and it was a virtual event. So people would post in the chat. There's a lot of people in the room. And I said, uh, who here thinks uh, a better employee is someone who wants to do the job or someone who needs to do the job? Mm -hmm. And no surprise, the hundreds of responses came in and everyone said, clearly the person who wants to do it. Mm -hmm. But this is true for the owner too. Do you really want to do everything? I think we want the, the end effect of the wedding we've delivered and seeing it all come together. Maybe we want the excitement or energy of negotiating, getting other vendors involved. There's certain wants, but I suspect in between those wants, we're packed in with a lot of needs. Well, you got to get the invoicing done. You got to, you need to do this. You need to do that. Yes. What we need to do is clean the, uh, the slate hundred percent, mm -hmm. everything off your plate so that you, the business is now operating without you. And then we can go back and cherry pick the wants, the ones that give us the most joy. And, th and that's our super strength too. When we do what we want to do, we naturally insert ourselves in the most productive efficient, exciting, high energy way. Yeah. So clean everything off the plate. That's step one. And that takes time. Mm -hmm. Once the business doesn't need you, now you can do what you want to do. And you'll naturally be a great contributor. And one last thing, sometimes stuff happens. I, I remember when I was in grade school, we had fire alarm drills and uh, the fire alarm would go off. Everyone stand up and you march in single file to leave the school in case there was a fire. 
Well, after doing this the, I don't know, hundredth time, sure enough, uh, in seventh grade, we had a fire that was pretty catastrophic and no mm -hmm. one got hurt, no one. And the reason was we had rehearsed over and over again, the fire drill goes off, you stand up, you march out of the room and uh, you assemble in a certain area in the parking lot. Yeah. Well, in our business, this leaving our business for a four week vacation every year, particularly during the, the busy season <laughs> is that fire drill. Yes. Do it over and over again. And then one day it may happen. Hopefully it's not a health scare, but that could happen. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity that you want to travel. Uh, maybe you have to be there for someone else. And when it happens, that sure as heck better not be your first fire drill. Yes, Mike, because of you, my family took a four week RV trip yes. and I know it was amazing. Yes. And my kids even commented that they were like, cause we had always taken our computers with us. My husband and I are both full-time for our business and we would mm -hmm. take vacations, but we always had work time during our vacations. Yeah. And we didn't hate that, but, <laughs> and so yeah. then we, but we took this four week vacation completely unplugged. I was so proud of us. It was amazing. And you really opened our eyes to say, we absolutely can do this. It's just a matter of, of us wanting to do it and to putting those practices in place. Oh, I'm so proud of you. And, and I'm so proud of you. And I, look at the impact you had on your kids too. You know, how, what they observed is more important than what we say to them. Yes. I'm like, oh, you know, so that's a huge lesson you gave them. But I think the grandest lesson is mm -hmm. your business and your colleagues. You said, listen, I trust you. Yes. I know this business will be here. And the idea of the four week vacation isn't so much as us getting a vacation as the business getting a vacation from us. Yes. The fact you did it is amazing. And I, I hope you're encouraged to do it again year after year. For sure. For sure. I'm so excited oh. to continue it. So Mike, thank you so much for being here. I Guys, if you yep. have not read the book, please go grab it. We're going to be giving them away in the Wedding Pro CEO community as well. So jump over there and look for those giveaways. It really will change the way you think about your business and the way that you run your business. And um, I just appreciate you so much, Mike. Thanks for being here. Randy, my pleasure. Thank you.